A computer virus is a piece of program code that, when executed, spreads within and between computers, either by physical transmission, remote deployment, or by stealth, evading detection by hiding within seemingly innocuous documents, files, and applications, or by replicating and dispersing their progeny to other applications and computers. But what are they? What is the threat? And how can we protect ourselves? The first computer virus was developed by Bob Thomas and was called Creeper, an experimental self-replicating virus released to the world in 1971. Its primary task was to replicate and spread to other systems. In this case, its targets were DEC computers linked to ARPANET and would display the message, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. This would display on all linked teletype computer screens. By 1988, computer virus development had leaped forward with the first virus that would infect personal computers running MS-DOS, called Brain. Released in 1986 and developed by two brothers in Pakistan, it was originally designed as a copy protection application. Following that, in 1988, the Morris virus was developed by Robert Morris, a grad student from Cornell University who used weak security in Unix SendMail and other applications as well as weak passwords to distribute the virus, which spread extensively. The aim of the virus was to measure the size of the Internet, but due to a programming error, it spread so fast it couldn't be contained and inadvertently began interfering with the normal operation of computers. The Morris virus infected almost all of the known Internet at that time, which comprised of around 15,000 computers and did so within 15 hours. What is a virus? All computer programs are essentially a series of zeros and ones, otherwise known as binary code, which, as they increase in scale and complexity, build up bits of information. Bits of information combine to form instructions for computers to perform specific tasks. These lines of code in a typical computer enable the user to perform higher functions, such as calculation and an aggregate of many processes combined to make applications. This has resulted in the publishing of a dizzying array of applications that perform an almost infinite number of tasks. Some applications are better than others. However, Lotus Notes, Microsoft Bob, Adobe Reader and Ask Toolbar being a few of the worst rated programs in the world. Applications are complex often taking considerable resources to write and are susceptible to bugs, which is simply an error in the code. But these errors can exhaust considerable resources removing the errors or debugging systems. It is thought that a computer programming error was behind the US and Russia narrowly averting World War III when Russia's early warning system incorrectly alerted them, suggesting the US had launched a missile attack. And, something as simple as a unit conversion calculation, crashed a $327 million Mars orbiter in 1998, demonstrating how complex computers have become and how many entry points there are for malicious activity. Computer viruses are like biological ones in some respects in how they behave. Their purpose is to spread from host to host replicating themselves. In the early days, when Brain was released, there was a lack of reliable connectivity between computers, so its mode of transmission was physical, transferring the program onto a floppy drive, for example, and installing it on the target computer. The most interesting thing about the motives of the early virus writers was that they didn't really have any motive at all, and that for the most part they were written to demonstrate ability and gain bragging rights to show other programmers how great they were. The first instance of a really damaging physically transferred virus was Michelangelo, which is classified as a boot sector virus, that infects the startup sectors of storage devices and would wipe the user's storage drive, typically a hard drive, and would only do so on March the 6th, Michelangelo's birthday. Most of the viruses in the early days were still just seen as jokes. The programmers were playing games with the user. These viruses became the things that would alert the user that their computer was infected. The programmers would use little animations, phrases and logos. The Joshi virus, for example, would infect a user's computer, then every January 5th the computer would halt during startup and would only continue when the user entered Happy Birthday Joshi. So what is the point of a computer virus? Well, that largely depends on what you want to gain. Inserting a malicious piece of code onto a target computer can have many different outputs, but as computer viruses have evolved, their objective has become far more sinister. From geopolitical, criminal, financial, activism-backed to blackmail and many others. 
The writers of computer viruses have only the darkest of intentions in recent times, and with our interconnected planet, these viruses have the ability to create fear, panic and global chaos. The not-so-happy 99 virus was the first known email virus, joyfully celebrating the new year on a user's computer, then spread itself through email contact lists to other users. With the creation of the email virus, a new hybrid came out shortly after called Melissa. The Melissa virus was an email virus and a macro virus. Users could see a disguised virus, often appearing as a document file sent from someone they knew, and would open it, and the virus would infect their documents and spread again through email contact. This is where they became more complex, as viruses changed from a simple one-stage to a multi-stage virus. One of the fastest growing viruses for its time was the Code Red virus in 2001, which is an example of a worm that utilized a known vulnerability, buffer overflow, to spread to adjacent memory locations and infect the entire system. This virus cost billions of dollars in damage and it spread across the globe in hours, with North America, Western Europe and China seeing the most dramatic and sustained infection rates. The virus is now in infinite sleep mode and stopped infecting computers around the end of July 2001. It is believed it won't awaken unless deliberately executed. The US FBI were so concerned about Code Red that they suggested it could bring down the entire internet due to increased traffic from scans. Currently, the threat posed by computer crime is estimated to be in the region of $6 trillion, and that's only the amount we can reliably quantify today. This makes cybercrime the third largest economy globally. MyDoom was the most devastating computer virus to date and has caused over $38 billion in damages. In addition to being the most expensive virus to date, its effects were far-reaching and fast-moving, with huge organizations like SCO, Unix, Red Hat, Microsoft and IBM either suing each other or offering rewards for the capture of the creator. The attentions of these global corporations soon turned to the open-source community to place the blame and tease out the creator of the virus. When a user was infected with the MyDoom, it created network openings which allowed other people, those that were looking for these openings, to have access to your computer. The virus also has the ability to open random programs and in 2004 it was estimated that some 25% of all emails had been infected by the virus. The evolving threat of computer viruses is their proposed ability to self-mutate via directed evolution, which differs from biological viruses that undergo undirected or chance mutations due to environmental stresses or faults in the coding process. Directed evolution is pre-programmed with a specific purpose in mind, principally to evade detection from antivirus software and to penetrate or move within an infected computer system and achieve its objective. Undirected evolution is focused on reproduction and dissemination of the virus progeny to other hosts. The effectiveness of this process is measured on the capacity of the virus to replicate and disseminate versus the time a host remains capable of supporting the viral load, i.e. not dead. Highly effective biological and computer viruses go undetected for long periods of time, achieve their objective, replicate effectively and disseminate their viral progeny to other hosts. The fear is our development of computer viruses surpasses our ability to contain the spread, and new technology such as artificial intelligence and machine learning could lead to the spread of viruses, with the capacity to mutate either so randomly we cannot achieve containment or purposefully change and manipulate their code to such an extent it becomes aware of our efforts to destroy it. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This could cause a global meltdown financial systems to go offline, logistics systems fail, and nuclear weapons being launched automatically. The potential for global chaos is a very real threat, and as nation-states and independent groups become ever more skilled at programming viruses, that tipping point becomes closer and closer. Judgment Day awaits. Often described as a war without end, what is our fate when it comes to computer viruses and malicious software? And how can we prevent global catastrophe? The internet is effectively borderless, so switching off the internet is not really an option for almost all countries, although many believe that some governments do have the ability, but legislation in many countries will stop most governments from owning a kill switch for the internet. 
The people behind some of the most dangerous cyber attacks may well be supported by entire nations, and it has caused an international stir on how cyber weapons, which are just complex viruses and well-executed packaging, can possibly be defended. It is known that almost every country in the world has its own dedicated research and development team, however large or small, that is focused on both offensive and defensive cybersecurity activity. Cyberspace is real, and almost all of us live within it, conducting our business, catching up with family, storing our personal files, pictures and videos, protecting our secrets. It's all there in the digital world, and available to those that want it, for personal benefit, financial gain, or geopolitical reasons. Our saving grace is that we are becoming more aware of the threat of viruses and malicious activity and how it affects our daily lives, from phishing to social engineering and data privacy. We have a treasure trove of antivirus and anti-malware solutions, encryption algorithms and multi-factor authentication and biometric solutions, shielding us from the vast majority of threats if we choose to use them. We all need to ensure we don't become a casualty in the war raged in cyberspace. We can all exist digitally without compromising our privacy by remaining vigilant, not oversharing personal information, keeping your computers, tablets and phones updated with the latest antivirus software, being sceptical of anyone asking for personal information, and be cautious with anything that is unfamiliar, especially if it's sent to you by email. Check headers and sent from addresses to check the authenticity of the sender. Computer viruses started life as a way for programmers to demonstrate experience and credibility to peers in a fun and mischievous way, and they found novel ways of getting computers to do all sorts of tasks. Somewhere along the way, this knowledge started to be used to infect, exploit and destroy, and during the later years of the 1990s, the proliferation of personal computing across the world broke down geographic borders, connecting the human race across continents. This connectivity led to the most costly and destructive viruses being able to thrive in the new digital world we created. Those that would look to benefit from computer crime found a place to hide and remain mostly hidden to this day. The war in cyberspace will continue on, a war of attrition that we can see no defining reason to stop any time soon. All we can do is be vigilant, protect our privacy and our data, and legislate against those who try to impact on these values. Stay safe online. Here at Cyber Breakdown, we work tirelessly to bring quality content to our followers on YouTube and other social media. Each video we produce requires a huge investment in research, animation, sound and voice work. If you like what we're producing and want to support us further, why not become a patron by visiting patreon.com and follow the links to donate. If you have any views on how we could improve, then please get in touch using the comments section or tweet us using at Breakdown Cyber. Please remember to like and share our videos and subscribe for more cybersecurity videos coming soon.